So today's episode is going to be featuring an underrated commander. A commander like this one definitely deserves more respect than it's getting, and if you're playing against it, make sure you're careful because this one packs quite the punch. Now with all that said though, let's find out what commander this is. And that commander would be Karn Silver Golem, an oldie but a goodie. Now I actually personally own this deck and that's the reason that I'm showing the version of the card that I got, which is a gold bordered version because, well, it's cheaper and uh, my playgroup is completely fine with gold bordered cards like many players out there are. In fact, I have not run into one player that has ever not been fine with gold bordered cards, even though for whatever reason they're not legal in Commander. But that's a different discussion for a different day and one that I've actually already made an episode on. Regardless, Garden Silver Golem is a 4-4 legendary artifact creature golem that costs 5 and it says... Whenever Karn blocks or becomes blocked, it gets my sword plus 4 until end of turn. But the important part is... Pay 1, target non-creature artifact becomes an artifact creature with power and toughness each equal to its mana value until end of turn. So this is a very simple but incredibly impactful ability, essentially turning any of your artifacts that are not creatures into creature versions that can hit for a good amount, again, based on that card's converted mana cost. And by the vast majority of your army not being creatures, while that has a lot of implications and a lot of powerful things that you can do with that, I mean, at a base level, a card like Wrath of God is going to take out all creatures, you know, it's a fantastic Wrath, but even though that takes out your, you know, your commander, the rest of your army is going to be safe because they aren't creatures unless you want them to be. So while your opponent's boards might be getting cleared whenever Wraths occur, yours is going to pretty much stay intact. And on top of that, there are some pretty broken things that you can do by turning certain non-creature artifacts into artifact creatures as well, and we'll get to those here in a bit. Regardless, a few things outside of this commander, which again, even the gold bordered versions around $15 or so, and the actual regular versions are like $30 or so, so that's a pretty expensive commander. The rest of the deck is budget friendly, with every single card in the deck being less than $1. And on this deck tech, when I'm going through those cards, I'm going to be taking through different tactics to show you how this deck works and how we're going to win with it. And one last thing, make sure you keep in mind that in the description below, there is a link to a list of cards for this deck. So if you're interested in purchasing this deck, make sure you check that link out. But with all that said, let's see why Karn is such an underrated commander that many players out there sleep on, but should not be. So first up, of course, there's Wayfarer's Bobble, and yeah, although we are in a colorless stack, there are still wastes out there that are basic lands, so by paying two and tapping and sacrificing this, we can go get a waste into play tapped. But of course, we're nowhere near done with ramping just yet, because our mana rocks, again, can be creatures that can help us out. Well, okay, Everflying Chalice can't be because it has zero converted mana cost, but still, a fantastic mana rock, multi-kicker too. Enters Battlefield, that may charge counters on it, and it can tap for each charge counter on it to add colors to our mana pool. But then essentially, I believe every other card in this deck that is not a creature can be turned into an artifact creature with Karn, starting with Ebony Fly and Guardian Idol, which actually can turn into creatures themselves. Regardless, each of them enter the battlefield tapped, it can tap for a color, so some really good early ramp. Speed of which, there's Lickle Metal Torque, which can tap to make a non-land permanent artifact until end of turn, which can be really important in a lot of scenarios. I mean, this actually can just turn our opponent's things into artifacts, which we can then turn into creatures with Karn, so it can be a way to actually remove things in a sneaky way. Again, if someone casts a Wrath of God, and we want to get rid of, say, one of their enchantments, we turn it into an artifact, then we use Karn to turn a creature, and now it's gone. Regardless, we also have Mind Zone and Prismatic Lens, each of which can tap for a colorless as well and cost two, and Mind Zone we can actually pay one to tap and sacrifice to draw a card. But next up, we've got some three mana mana rocks that have some utility to them with Commander Sphere, Orozca Relic, and Network Terminal, each of which can also draw us cards, but in different ways. Commander Sphere can be sacrificed to draw a card. Orozca Relic can also be sacrificed to gain us three life and draw a card for the city's blessing, and Network Terminal has... Pay one tap, tap another untapped artifact you control, draw a card, then discard a card. So while that isn't technically card advantage, it is card selection, and it can get rid of a dead card in our hand. Next up, we also have some other card advantage, Mana Rocks at 3 mana with Bonner's Ornament, Letter of Acceptance, and Mana Geode. If we pay 4 and tap Bonner's Ornament, we're going to be drawing a card, and, you know, if our opponents happen to have one as well, they can draw one too. Chances are they're probably not going to have one though. 
With Utter Acceptance, we can pay two to tap and sacrifice it to draw a card. And Mana Geode's going to have a Scry 1 when it enters the battlefield, which again, isn't card advantage, but it is fantastic card selection. Next up, some other three Mana Mana Rocks that helps out in different ways. There's Pristine Talisman, which can gain us life. Dark Seal Ignit, which is indestructible. And Unearned Heirloom, which can get rid of cards in players' graveyards. This can be a nice additional effect that can really help us out, especially against graveyard synergies. And then our final mana rock that taps for one, Unstable Obelisk, it can tap for a color, so we can pay seven to tap and sacrifice to destroy target permanent. So this can be a great piece of removal that can help us out in a lot of situations. But of course, we are not done with our ramp just yet. Because next up, we've got Victory Chimes, which can help us out in a lot of situations, especially with our commander it has. It's going to untap during each of the player's untapped step, but it can tap in a player of our choice, adds colorless. So basically, this is four activations of our commander with each trip on the table if we want to do so, or again, just another way to utilize our mana on our opponent's turns for other abilities. And then next up at four mana, we've got Sisse's Ring and Urgolem's Eye, both of which are the exact same thing. They both tap for two. Speaking of which, we've got a newer card with Stone Speaker Crystal, which can tap for two, and we can pay two to tap and sacrifice it and exile any number of cards from target players' graveyards and draw a card. So this card can help us out in a lot of scenarios. And speaking of drawing cards, there's Hedron Archive, which can tap for two. We can pay two and tap and sacrifice it to draw two. And then Dreamstone Hedron, which is a fantastic card in this deck. Taps for three, pay three and tap and sacrifice it, draw three cards. And actually, Dreamstone Hedron is part of a combo that we'll talk about here in a bit. Regardless, next up, we've got some other ways to help us out with our mana with Foundry Inspector and Jorah's Familiar, which makes our artifacts cost one less to cast. So although these don't technically ramp us again, they can save us a ton of mana throughout the game, making all of our artifacts cheaper. And, and yeah, this can really add up to a ton of value as the game goes on. And speaking of value, next up, let's talk about Horizon Stone, Manifold Key, and Draw Scorpion. Horizon Stone says if you lose unspent mana, that mana becomes colorless instead, which, you know, is basically what our mana is anyways. So yeah, this is basically just a way for us to store our mana, and this can be incredible. And then Manifold Key is a very flexible card. Pay one and tap, untap another target artifact. Pay three and tap, target creature can't be blocked this turn. So with any of our artifacts that produce more than one mana, this can essentially just be an extra mana rock for us, or it can be a way to help us get our creatures through. Or again, just a way to utilize an artifact's tap ability again. Speaking of which, there's Draw Scorpion, which says whenever it and other artifact creatures put a from play, you may untap target artifact. So this is just some free value, essentially, that can help us untap our artifacts, including, you know, mana rocks just to get us mana back when our artifact creatures die. Now, as good as all these cards are, there is still one, in my opinion, that stands above the rest, and that is the Golden Pig of this deck, which is the number one card out of our 99. And the Golden Pig for this deck is Voltaic Construct. Now, this card did have an errata. Now it is a 2-2 Golem Construct, so keep that in mind, which is important. We'll talk about why here in a bit. Cost four, and it has paid two untapped target artifact creature. This card is absolutely incredible in this deck for many reasons. And the first one I'm going to bring up is, like I mentioned earlier, Dreamstone Hedron combos with a certain card. And that card is this. Well, and our commander too. Because with Dreamstone Hedron, all you need to do is utilize your commander to turn it into an artifact creature, then tap it for three mana, use two of that mana to add into this to untap Dreamstone Hedron, which of course is now an artifact creature, no longer just an artifact. And then you can do that as many times as you want for infinite colorless mana, which you can then, of course, make all of your artifacts into artifact creatures as well. And of course, get any of their tap abilities an infinite number of times as well. And even if you aren't going infinite with this, this is still a fantastic card that again can just help you utilize artifact abilities again and again and again. Or should I say again, in combination with our commander, turning those artifacts into artifact creatures. But yeah, Voltaic Construct is an incredible card in this deck, and it is definitely worthy of the title of Golden Pig. Moving on, though, let's talk about some ways to generate value in this deck with cards like Endbringer, Sandstone Oracle, and Trading Post. Endbringer is going to untap during each other player's untap step. It can tap to ping for one. We can pay one to tap and target creature can attack or block this turn, or we can pay two and tap to draw a card. So yeah, this can provide us a lot of value in a lot of different ways throughout the game. 
Next up, Sandstorm Oracle is a great way to refill our hand in a lot of situations. When it enters the battlefield, we choose an opponent. If that player has more cards in hand than us, we draw cards equal to the difference. And speaking of drawing cards, well, Trading Post does a lot of things. We can pay one and tap it to do one of four things. We can discard a card to gain four life. We can pay one life and create a zero one goat creature token. We can sacrifice a creature to return an artifact from our graveyard to our hand, or we can sacrifice an artifact to draw a card. So this is kind of like a Swiss army knife that can help us out in a lot of situations. Next up, we've got some vehicles that can provide us some value with Smuggler's Copter and Weatherlight. And keep in mind with Karn, we actually don't even have to crew these to turn these into artifact creatures. We can just pay one to do so, and that will override their power and toughness on the card. But still, a great thing to keep in mind and a great way to get around that crew cost. Regardless, when Smuggler's Copter attacks, we can draw a card and discard a card. And Weatherlight has when deals counter to a player. We look at the top five cards of our library, and we can get a historic card, which includes artifacts, of course, off the top of our library and into our hand. And speaking of off the top of our library, Oracle's Vault has paid two and tap, exile the top card of your library until that turn you may play that card, put a brick counter on Oracle's Vault. And then once we get three or more brick counters on Oracle's Vault, we can essentially tap this for free and cast the top card of our library for free. So this can definitely be a great target to start untapping with some of our effects that we've talked about so far. Moving on though, how about Eye of Vecna, which is going to draw us a card and lose us two life when it enters the battlefield, and at the beginning of Rubkeep, we can pay two to do the same. Next up, Investigator's Journal is going to enter the battlefield a number of suspect counters on it, equal to the greatest number of creatures a player controls, which again, might be us in certain circumstances if we make a lot of artifacts into creatures. Regardless, by paying two, we can tap to remove a counter from it to draw a card, and we can pay two and sacrifice it to draw a card. Or how about Arcane Encyclopedia, which is a very simple card, pay three, tap, draw a card. But in a bigger way, there's Lore Seeker Stone, which has pay three and tap, draw three cards. Now this ability does cost one more to activate for each card in our hand, but there are definitely gonna be times where we can just dump our hand onto the table with the amount of ramp that we have in this deck. Which can also benefit us with Gear Poor Ori, which says each player may play additional land on each of their turns, and at the beginning of each player's upkeep of that player has no cards in hand, they draw three cards. And then Darksteel Pendant is indestructible, which of course is fantastic text to see on an artifact in this deck. Because yeah, when we make this new a creature, this can be a fantastic blocker because it's indestructible. We can just keep blocking with it. Regardless, it also has pay one and tap two scry one, which again is fantastic card selection. But finally, there's Ingenuity Engine, which can hit really hard when we turn into a creature, and it can also provide value in a different way by cascading. On top of that, by paying one, we can tap and sacrifice an artifact to bounce an artifact we control back to its owner's hand, and this can help us out in a lot of different ways. I mean, especially with ETBs, and, and yeah, just a different way to save artifacts or to take advantage of their ETBs again. But of course, we've got other ways to get even more value out of this deck with cards like Scrapyard Recombiner, Moon Silver Key, and Scrap Trawler. Scrapyard Recombiner has tap, sacrifice, and artifact, search your life for a construct card, reveal it, put in your hand, then shuffle your library. And yeah, there are quite a few constructs in this deck. And keep in mind, again, because of that Oracle text change, Voltaic Construct is a construct, so go get that combo piece. Speaking of which, there's Moon Silver Key, which has pay one tap, sacrifice, Moon Silver Key, search your life for an artifact card with a mana ability or a basic land card, reveal it, put in your hand, then shuffle. So yeah, you can go get Dreamstone Hedron with this as well, or a different artifact that might help you out depending on whatever situation you're in. And then Scrap Trawler can provide us a ton of value with this stack. Whenever it or another artifact we control is put in a grave from the battlefield, return to your hand, target artifact card in your grave with a lesser mana value. This can get us back a lot of things and provide us a ton of value throughout the game. Next up, though, let's talk about ways to cause our opponents a ton of pain, especially with a card like Metalwork Colossus, a 10-10. That's going to cost X less to cast for X, a total converted mana cost of non-creature artifacts we control. So generally, this 11 mana 10-10 is usually going to cost us zero mana. And we can also get it back by sacrificing two artifacts to return it from our graveyard to our hand. Moving on, Seal Overseer has tap put a plus one counter on each artifact creature you control, so this can be a great way to build up more and more counters on all of our creatures. And again, even our artifacts that are not creatures, we just simply turn them into creatures, tap this, get counters on them, and build them up over time. And then Sculpting Steel is just a fantastic card. It can enter the battlefield as a copy of any artifact on the battlefield. So yeah, if you want a second Metalwork Colossus, for example, have fun. Go for it. Another 3 mana artifact, though, that can provide us a lot of value throughout the game is Shimmer Mirror. It is a 2-2 with Flash that gives artifact spells. We have Flash. 
And playing at flash speed is, of course, a very powerful thing. We get to save our mana up for our opponent's turns and do what we need to do then. And speaking of saving something up for our opponent's turns, well, something we might want to do right before our turn is Mere Incubator. It has space 6 and tap, sacrifice it to search library for any number of artifact cards, move them from the game, then put that many 1-1 one -one Mere Artifact Creature Tokens into play. This can be a fantastic way to finish off our opponents all at once. We basically just say, okay, um, yeah, we're going to get rid of a ton of artifacts in our deck, make a massive army out of nowhere, and good luck. And speaking of good luck, well, Soul Conduit can completely turn around a situation for us by paying six and tapping it, we make two target players exchange life totals. This can take us from a very ugly situation into the driver's seat, or, you know, we can use this in a political way as well to swap life totals from our opponents. Regardless, a very fantastic card, and again, if we turn to a creature, it's hitting pretty hard at six. But now let's talk about some ways to throw wrenches into our opponent's plans with cards like God Pharaoh's Statue, Transmogrifying Wand, and Sky Sovereign. God Pharaoh's Statue says, spells your opponent's cast cost two more to cast at the beginning of your end step, each opponent loses one life. This can slow our opponents down to a crawl and make casting anything incredibly difficult for them. Next up, Transmogrifying Wand is a great way to take out our opponent's creatures. By paying one and tapping it, we get rid of one of the charged counters to destroy a creature and replace it with a 2-4 ox. And speaking of taking out creatures, Sky Sovereign is a 6-5 and when it enters the battlefield or attacks, it deals three damage to our creature, planeswalker, and opponent controls. And again, it does have a crew cost of three, but we could just override that crew cost with our commander and make it into a 5-5 flyer instead for just one mana. So yeah, that's going to be worth it in a lot of situations. Moving on, we've got some creatures that can help us out as well, starting with Meteor Golem, a 3-3 that has when it's the battlefield destroy target non-land permanent and opponent controls. And then Steel Hellcat is a 5-5, and when it gets through on a player and deals combat damage to them, we can pay X to destroy each non-land permanent with converted mana cost X whose controller was dealt combat damage by Steel Hellcat this turn. Speaking of getting rid of multiple things, there's Spine of Ishza. It has when it enters the battlefield, destroy a target permanent, and when it's been to a grave from the battlefield, return it to its owner's hand. So with our commander again, this is effectively a 7-7 that can keep destroying permanents, and we can keep getting back out if it gets dealt with. Next up, even in a colorless deck, we actually have some spells that can help us out as well with Introduction to Annihilation and Scour from Existence. Introduction to Annihilation is going to exile target non-land permanent, its controller can draw a card. And Scout from Existence is going to just straight up exile target permanent, so yeah, either of these can be very helpful in a lot of situations. And speaking of helpful, finally we do have some Wraths in this deck with cards like Time Bomb, Freeing Line, and False Floor. Time Bomb is going to build up counters over time, and essentially at some point we can pay one tap and sacrifice it and deal damage to each creature and each player equal to the amount of time counters on it. Again, since our artifacts are not creatures unless we want them to be, well, we can save our army and take out our opponent's army at the same time. Speaking of which, there's Fraying Lion, which has, when it enters the battlefield, put a rope counter target creature you control. And then during everyone's upkeep, they can either pay two to put a rope counter on a creature they control, and if not, every other creature that does not have a rope counter on it gets exiled. So again, we have a great way of avoiding basically most of this wrath. Speaking of which, there's False Floor that it's going to enter the battlefield tapped, and it says creatures enter the battlefield tapped and pay two, tap, exile False Floor, exile all untapped creatures, activate only as a sorcery. Forcing creatures to come to play tapped is huge because, again, if our creatures, well, aren't creatures, again, they're just artifacts, until we actually make them an artifact creatures, they come to play untapped still, but our opponent's creatures do not. And of course, again, like I mentioned multiple times with these, we can easily get the vast majority of our army around this effect. So in many ways, these can essentially be one-sided board wipes. But now that we've talked about every single non-land card in this deck, let's talk about the lands. First up, there's Skyreach Sanitarium, which can help us loot, Arch Roscoe, which can help us draw, and Seagate Wreckage, which can help us draw if we've got no cards in our hand. With a colorless deck like this one, we've got a lot of opportunity for a ton of utility lands to be used. So next up, we've got Cryptic Caves and Roadside Reliquary, each of which we can sack to draw a card, and Zulfir and Void, which is going to enter the battlefield, and we scry one. Next up, there's Blast Landscape, which we can cycle away, Majoring Net, which can store up mana, and Triumph for Second Gods, which can essentially tap for two for our colorless spells at a certain point. And speaking of tapping for more mana, there's Urza's Mine, Urza's Power Plane, Urza's Tower, each of which tap for one, but if we've got all three of them, they tap for seven mana in total, which is huge. Moving on, there's Sequestered Sash and Buried Rune, which we can sacrifice to get artifacts out of our graveyard, and Emergence Zone, which can be sacrificed to let us cast spells at flash speed. And then there's Sanctum of Ugin, which says whenever you cast a colorless spell with converted mana cost 7 or greater, you can sacrifice it. And if you do search live for a colorless creature, reveal it, put in your hand, then shuffle. So yeah, this can be a great way to actually go get one of our combo pieces. And then Crawling Barons and Mistress Factory can each be turned into creature lands. 
Speaking of which, there's Red Statuary, Mobilized District, which can also be turned into creatures, and Gargoyle Castle can be sacrificed to make a creature a 3-4 with flying. Next up, we've got Founder of the Consoles, which can be sacrificed for two Thopters, and Spawning Bed, which can be sacrificed for three Eldrazi Scions that can be sacrificed for mana. And speaking of sacrifice, there's High Market, which has tap sacrifice a creature, you gain one life. Which is somewhat similar to Phyrexia's Core, which is pay one tap sacrifice an artifact, you gain one life. And with gaining life, there's Radiant Fountain, which has managed to outfield you, gain two life, and two of the Spirit Dragon has paid two and tap you, gain one life for each colorless creature you control, which again, can be a ton. Moving on, there's Rogue's Passage, which can help get creatures through, and Labyrinth of Scopos, and Mystifying Maze, which can actually protect us from creatures that are attacking. Next up, there's Underdark Rip, which can get rid of an artifact creature or Planeswalker, essentially getting it down into an opponent's library based on a dice roll, and Tectonic Edge, which can be sacrificed to destroy a non-basic land. And then there's Tyrite Sanctum, which can help make a creature into a god, and then make it into an indestructible god, and Thespian Sage, which can essentially become a copy of any land on the battlefield. And of course, finally, the rest of the deck is Wastes. But now that we've talked about every single card in this deck, let's talk about the price. Like I mentioned before, outside of the very expensive commander, every other card in this deck is less than $1, so even with Karn's cost in there, the deck is still just $54.37. And actually, you might be able to save some on this deck by buying this deck on TCG Player and utilizing heavily played and damaged cards, which of course need a home too. Though do keep in mind that this estimated cost does not include the cost of shipping, which might vary depending upon where you live. And with that, the show has come to a close, so it's my turn to hear from you, so make sure you comment below and let me know what your thoughts on this episode are, and as always, thanks again and have a good one. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. We also have a ton of brand new t-shirt designs in stock, so make sure you check out those as well. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. 